Hi, welcome to the Verge Mobile Show. This is episode 76 for the week of January 20th, 2014. Uh, Dieter Bone is actually, I think, at an airport right now, so he is not with us, but I'm Dan Seifert. I'm Vlad Savo. I'm Chris Sigler. And the rest of us are here, and uh, it feels like it's been forever since we've done a show, but it was only like a week and a half ago that we were at CES, wasn't it? Well, I haven't done a show since 2013, I don't think. <laughs> so, there's that. But, by the way, I would just like to point out that Dieter, the reason Dieter is not here is not only is he trying to get on an airplane, but he's trying to get on an airplane specifically from Minneapolis to New York City, which is going into a Polar Vortex 2.0 right now. And yeah, he's going from, like, one tundra to another. Yeah, there's, like, no chance of this plane actually taking off. I don't know why he's even trying. Uh, but my understanding is that his flight, as of right now, is not canceled, so we'll see if he makes it. Yeah, well, our, uh, our, we hope that uh, Dieter gets in safe, but we're going we're gonna to carry on without him anyways. So I just had a really disturbing moment while Chris was detailing Dieter's uh, uh, travails. Uh, I had a window open with a Verge Mobile Show stream on it, and it started streaming randomly. And he was like, hi, this is uh, episode 76. <laughs> I'm Dan Seifert, and Chris is still talking about detours. Like, what's going on? I've had that happen before. You know why? So yesterday I was saying on Twitter... You guys don't uh, use Flash Block? I don't understand this. Like, you just no, have I, Flash I, Windows going randomly wild in your browsers. I, just... I don't want to... I don't, I don't like blocking anything. I want all media to be blasted <laughs> at my face at all times. This is how I how is, your, how is your computer not, like, at a, like, constant crawl? <laughs> Has well, baby. That's how. Look, so I, I was saying on Twitter yesterday that, uh, that Chrome's uh, uh, sound indicator in the, in the tab bar is, like, the greatest innovation in the history of computing. And That's what Vlad... saved me just now. Yes. Yeah, I knew it. Yeah. See? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, man. That was it. But but I, I would like to point out, uh, I tweeted today uh, complaining about Google's policies. Uh, specifically, where the issue was that China is now introducing a new policy uh, to say that if you're uploading a video on the internet, you have to have an account with your real name associated with it. Um, which my immediate reaction, Thomas Ricker's immediate reaction, basically everybody's immediate reaction was, ah, oh, that's exactly what Google did with YouTube, you know? And it's just kind of ironic when you have Google trying to be the do-gooder in the world and China being, you know, the uh, dictatorial controlling nation, the latter following the footsteps of the former. It wasn't supposed to be that way. So anyway, I had a little tweet about that, and I think the Hangouts issues that delayed our start today are kind of a reaction to it. <laughs> you mean you mean Google is actively targeting your, your account and... I'm pretty sure. Yeah. We are having some inexplicable issues with Google Hangouts today that none of us can really... So here's out. the thing with Google Hangouts is we seem to have inexplicable, inexplicable issues with Google Hangouts virtually every week, but they are different inexplicable issues every single week. Like, there's no way to predict or prepare for them because it's always different. In that regard, it's actually a lot like Skype, where literally <laughs> every Skype call I have with Nilay Patel starts with Nilay, or, or, or me, one of us saying, God, I hate Skype, uh, because <laughs> something bizarre is happening. My current issue that is, I, I basically can't have people call me on Skype now because uh, the, the Skype app rings, but then also something else rings on my machine. Uh, so, like, I'll answer the call, but, like, the Skype ringing keeps playing. Even if I close the Skype app entirely, there's still the Skype ringing for about two minutes. It's the weirdest problem. Uh, if, if a Skype engineer is listening to this right now, please, I'm begging you, help me figure <laughs> out why this is happening. Like, I Wait, literally you, can't take a Skype call now. You, you're sure the Skype ringing carries on, on your computer and not inside your mind? It might be inside my mind. I, I can't rule that out. I, you I just wish really I could. count your count your blessings, Chris. That you I, can't I, take Skype calls. I th yeah, that's true. Um, I can make <laughs> Skype calls, but I can't uh, I can't take them. But but I, I I wish I could rule out that I'm going crazy, but I can't. It, that's that's a strong possibility. So uh, this is the Verge Mobile Show. So I guess we should talk about mobile stuff, right? Look, Chrome is on phones, Skype is on phones. <laughs> I would submit that we've been talking about nothing but mobile so far. 
Touche. Uh, but we do have actually stuff to talk about. So um, the Moto X is coming to Europe soon, which is yay good news for Europe. Uh, I know a lot of people have been waiting a long time for it to be available outside of North America, and I think it's available in South America, but maybe in the in the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, but well, the the Moto G is a bigger deal for South America, right? Um, but the, yeah. the yeah. the question is in Europe in Western Europe in particular, uh, did they wait too long? And it seems mm-hmm. like that it's coming at a pretty high price, isn't that right, Vlad? They're they're gonna ask four hundred and thirty euro, which is like more than it costs in dollars in the U.S. No, it, it's always more than it costs in dollars in the U.S. But then also, let's not forget that the U.S. price is like the bare minimum that nobody actually pays. Uh, ultimately, you guys have taxes that get tacked on. Yeah, but, uh, but I mean, no, I mean like... Area, you get extra costs. There, there, I mean the 430 euro that Motorola is selling for is more in in like sheer numbers of units of dollars, The not talking about conversions, uh, than the $399 that they're asking for in the U.S. If you convert that $399 to, U, to, to euro, it's like, what, seven or 800 bucks or 750 bucks or something like that? Um, so it's, it's not quite that bad. It's not quite that bad. But, but yes, yeah, it's... Um, actually, the euro is more valuable than the dollar. But, yeah, it's expensive. Uh, yeah, the, the euro is more, more expensive. Than the I think that's, the, that's I what think makes it so the, weird. I think the distinction here. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, I take your point now. I take your point. I think the distinction here is that the X is certainly at a higher price point. Let's put it that way, uh, relative to where it is in the U.S. Uh, if even setting aside my pedantry about conversion rates and uh, U.S. you know misrepresentations with pricing. But to answer Chris's question, which I think is the important one, I got a hold of a Moto X uh, about a week ago now. Uh, you know, now that it's finally coming to Europe and. I have to say my immediate reaction was it doesn't matter at all that this is coming six or however many months later than the US release. It doesn't matter at all. Uh, the way that this phone has been designed, the way it's been put together, it was never about the specs to begin with. So the fact that it, a few months have expired doesn't make it any less interesting or compelling to people. That being said, I am a little bit disappointed. It has lost a little bit of its sheen for me now that I've had time to spend with it. Um, I still think industrial design and the screen and the screen bezel are just superb. I mean, I don't even I don't even know how you can improve on them. But the camera on the Moto X to me is like just don't bother with it. It's like a, it's like you put a front facing camera on the back of the phone. It's embarrassing. Okay, and that, that's a big issue for me. And the battery isn't great. Like I'm not happy so, with it. So I I've actually I've owned a Moto X for over a month now, I guess. I'm going on six weeks or something that I've owned it. Whenever they put it on sale, I bought it. Um, and uh, I will totally agree with you, the camera. The camera is super disappointing. I've gotten some good usable shots out of it, but most of the time the shots are, are pretty pretty disappointing and it's very hit or miss still. Um, and as far as the battery goes, I was getting really bad battery life for a long time. Like the, the phone just wouldn't idle or sleep. So this weekend I turned off the touchless control, which is the thing that lets you shout commands at it, and I turned off the assist function that detects when you're driving, which it uses GPS for and things like that, and the battery life has, like, dramatically improved, like, night and day difference. So it, it sucks that, like, I have to turn off the special Moto X features to get the battery life where I need it to be, um, but that, that did make a difference for me, at least. This represents a fundamental failure on the manufacturer's part when you're... you're, you're when some of your main selling points for your device need to be disabled in order to get acceptable battery life, you fundamentally failed in your mission to produce a viable commercial phone. Like it, that's not acceptable. It's not you. Like the average consumer should not need to like like research pro tips on how to improve their battery life. Like you should get the phone and it lasts a day and that's it. End of story. Yeah, and and the thing is like. You know, uh, Motorola, when they launched the Moto X, made a big deal about how these features use these low-power processors. They've got this X8 computing system, and it's it's not going to affect your battery life. But I can't say that that really is true, because it, it my experience is that it definitely directly affects the battery life. And turning those features off made a huge difference for me. So, so, so Dan, you described the difference when you nerfed the touchless controls 
as night and day. Does the phone actually last night and day? Because that would be the handy bit. So uh, yesterday I got like 20 hours of battery life out of it with four hours of the screen on, meaning that I'm interacting with it and things like that. Uh, today I am at... Uh, Sorry, I'm at 52% after 11 hours, so I'm kind of tracking for the same type of, of uh, uh, battery life, which is actually, like, for an Android phone, that's really good, in my experience. With well, my and, unless, it's, unless it's one of those really generous size ones, like the Galaxy Note 3 and the right. HTC One Max, because those things are hilarious. Like, their battery life just lasts and lasts. Yeah, but that's because you can put, like, you know, a generator inside the damn thing, because... <laughs> You know, <laughs> they're, they're so massive. But in a normal size phone, like, this is the kind of battery life that I get on my iPhone 5S, which is, I always, like, way better than the battery life that I get on Android phones. So this, I'm, like, I'm happy with. I'm not happy that I had to nerf the features in order to get it. Right, and, you know, to that point, actually, I've, ever since Apple came out with Siri and the whole talk-to-your-phone thing, my big concern and reluctance has been it's just really socially awkward. Like, it, it can be convenient, but the Google searches that I want to do or the things that I want to activate, I generally want to keep to myself, you know? <laughs> and even if you're not on the train where it's obviously weird and it's too noisy for the phone to pick up what you're saying, even if you're at home but with somebody else nearby or the neighbors nearby and, and you just start talking to your phone randomly, it's still socially awkward. We can't get over that hump. But having said that, I've started using the OK Google Now command. Uh oh, maybe the Moto X will pick it up now. But yeah, I started <laughs> using the command, and it's freaking good. It's really, really handy, actually. When it's re it's really searches. great when you're driving. Uh, like, I have a little dock in my car that I can put my phone, and I can just, like, shout at it to, like, respond to text messages or call people or set navigation. And that's, like, really where that shines for me. Um, yeah. But like I, I don't. Outside of that, I don't really use it a whole lot. But but, but also for me, it's surprising that it uh, the voice recognition is so accurate, because I don't input the most straightforward of things. It's not like find Justin Bieber videos, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm asking it for like nutritional information and random crap about video games. <laughs> of course you and are. It, and it's picking these things up, you know. <laughs> so so I mean, to me, it's great, but. The social hurdle is still kind of an odd one. It's kind, of, it's kind of like Google Glass. You can make it as awesome as you as you like, but it's still going to be just kind of weird. Well, have people ever considered... I mean, it's one thing now when there are only a couple of phones that support that command, but it, at some point in the future, you're going to be on a train and you're going to say, okay, Google Now, and half of the phones <laughs> in the car are going to light up. I wonder if uh, if this well is... in in the case of the Moto X, like you train it with your voice, and it's supposed yeah. to pretty much listen to you for your voice and your inflections and things like that. But on like the Nexus Five, there's no training involved, and it's supposed to learn as you go along. But really, you could just like turn it on and just hold the thing and say, "Okay, Google now," and it starts doing its thing. So yeah, uh, yeah, that'd be kind of interesting. I guess. I think the trick is to. Disable it. Well, I was going to say disable it when the phone's locked, but then that kind of defeats the purpose. Well, like on the Nexus 5, it doesn't work unless the phone is unlocked and turned on and you're seeing, you're looking at the home screen. Wait, really? There's no limited functionality mode when the phone is locked? Nope. Nope. It's that, the, the Nexus 5, so the, with the Nexus 5's Google Experience launcher, that, that function that lets you say... Uh, OK Google or OK Google Now only works when you're looking at the home screen. It doesn't work if you're in an app. It doesn't work if the phone's locked or anything like that. Hmm. That feels lame to me. Yes. Yeah, I guess. I, you know where I've used it a lot is like when I'm arguing with my friends about like who's in a specific movie or how... Or it, I, I should say I'm arguing with my wife about like how old a particular actor is in a TV show that we're watching and I'll just be like, OK Google Now, how old is Josh Duhamel? And then it just like tells me. And, and then, how old is he? Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> cool story, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like did, did you Touché. did you forget or did you? Well, I don't know. Of... For some reason, Joshua Hamill's name was the first one that popped into my mouth right now, or popped into my head right now when I was when I was. Wait, wait hold on, hold anecdotal on. Anecdotal experience. How old is Josh Duhamel? 
Not Justin Hamill. <laughs> Siri, man. Siri doesn't work. So no, no, now I have to use Google now and try it. I refuse to be. How old is Justin Hamill? I bet he's way uh, older than you. It's think. asking for Justin Hamill too because I can't speak. So, um, <laughs> anyways, I bet he's ancient. I bet he's like fifty-five. Hold on. Wow. So, so this is the Virgin Mobile Show, and the conclusion oh, he's is we're, we're going to do a Google search with our keyboard. There we go. <laughs> he, Thumbs up to everybody involved in this. He he's like twice as old as Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> Who is no longer in in the spotlight? Um, anyway, um, so yeah, so it's coming to the to uh, Europe, right next month, um, and then the wood editions finally are available at least here in the U.S. If you if you're able to access Moto Maker, which is the other thing that you don't get in Europe is no Moto Maker. So the dark one looks tight. The, I, whatever the darkest wood is, is that ebony? Yeah, it's so it's like ebony, teak, walnut, and then bamboo. Bamboo's been out for like a couple of weeks already. Uh, and, and I gotta say, the teak and the walnut look really tight. But you you seem to like the the, the ebony one, Chris. But well, the the, the teak, my my instinct would be to go with the teak because teak is renowned for its like resilience. So if it's something that you're gonna be handling a lot, uh, it seems like you'd want a wood that like can stand so, the test of time. So so apparently. The way no, that I don't want wood. The the way you that that don't. wait 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 we have breaking news. Kwame is is telling us that we pronounce his name incorrectly, and that's why it's not working. <laughs> yeah, jo- Josh. Josh. Josh Dumel. Josh Dumel. What? Okay, so wait. I'll, I'll try, try it. Oh, yeah. How old um, is Josh Dumel? How old is Josh Dumel? Dumel. Oh, that worked. Did it? Did you hear that? Yeah, it worked for both of you. Wait, wait, wait. For me, it came out, how old is Josh do Gmail? <laughs> I got it. He's 41, man. It worked. Yeah, no, I, I knew he was 41, but that's because I looked up on Chrome. Anyway, uh, Kwame, <laughs> thank you for the uh, for the correction. What were you talking about? Oh, we uh, were, no, guys, guys, seriously, I, I, I need to say this. The whole distinction between types of wood that Chris is drawing and saying that teak is particularly hardy, come on now. Well, yeah, what I was not... going to say was, in the case of the Moto X, it doesn't matter, because apparently, I think the only wood that they're using is bamboo, and the other colors are treated to look that color. So to streamline uh, production, it's not actually teak, and it's not actually ebony. That is so uh, lame. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah, I think it is actually all bamboo, and they're all treated. It might be a different material, but the three that they just added are not walnut, teak, and ebony woods. They are just treated to look that way. They don't so make like, that clear at all. It's like that the it's like that the the furniture that you buy at like an office supply store that's like like fi- compressed fiberboard and, and and it's got like a, a laminate on top to look like real wood. Uh, or I, would, I would or totally wherever. I would buy a port- uh, a particle board uh, <laughs> auto X. No, but that, that's the point I was going to say. You're not buying a, a wooden back phone because of its endurance or its uh, you know, durability and other such qualities. I mean, if you want that, you buy the plastic version. I mean, it's not it's not lovely to the touch. It's not awesome, but that's the thing that's going to last you the longest. Uh, wood has all of these heat-sensitive properties, fire-sensitive you mean properties. You it can catch on fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, no, but it's, it's not just fire. It, it's humidity. It's expanding. It's shrinking. It's doing all sorts of weird things. I mean, this is why people stop making wooden you houses. Want, you want to get that down into like the, the properties of the thing. Metal uh, does the same thing, right? Like it'll expand and contract in heat and things like that. We don't worry about our aluminum phones. I do. <laughs> I, I, I fret a lot. Like it really bothers me when when I code and I have to pick up. The phone for any particular reason. This is why I'm not such a huge fan. Like, I, I don't call Vlad up and he's like, I, I can't talk right now. My, my phone is too cold to hold. <laughs> and I refuse to wear a Bluetooth headset, right, Chris? That, that, that is true. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, yeah. So so that's it. If I'm using an aluminum phone, don't try to call me. Send me a text message. I mean, uh, I, I guess it's. A, I, I will say this. Like, even though it sucks that they're they're. Uh, like it's, this is basically false advertising because they're calling it teak, walnut, and ebony. But uh, bamboo is renewable; those other woods are not. Right. So I guess 
from an ecological perspective, it's probably the right. I mean, when you think about the manufacturing and costs, and they've got to tool this, and they've got to make sure that it meets all the standards and things like that. Uh, and obviously, it took them a long time to figure all this out because they initially showed off those things like six months ago, and now it's we're finally able to buy them today. Uh, and it's only costing you 25 bucks more than a plastic bag, which is uh, a no-brainer to me. I mean, that's, Chris, that's nice. I know the point you're trying to make, but I would just like to point out that all the other woods are also renewable. No, they aren't. If they, if they weren't, they'd be extinct right now. No, I, 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 no, that's absolutely not not true. I mean, like ebony is not ebony is like a, an endangered wood, basically. Right. Hold on, but I'm, it's I'm still gonna, renewable. I'm, hold it, on, he's going to do some, he's gonna do some furious Google searching. Wait, hang on. I'm I'm uh, I'm learning about ebony right now. Um, what you mean is the use of the wood is. More ah, as a result of unsustainable harvesting, many species yielding ebony are now considered threatened. Africa in particular has had most of its indigenous ebony cut down illegally, and for this reason it has become common for street traders to blacken lighter woods with shoe polish in an effort to make a sale. Yeah. Boom. Boom. That doesn't well, make uh, it non-renewable. I'm moving this along. Uh, the other big news that uh, Motorola had in the past couple weeks was that uh, Google announced that it's carrying or selling a Play Edition Moto G for the same price and the same features and the same software that Motorola uh, is selling the Moto G for. And I can't understand for the life of me why the Google Play Edition exists, uh, but it does. And so you can buy it from Google and you can buy it from Motorola, and I think you pretty much get the same phone either way. So. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess that's just a branding thing, right? Like, it probably gives them some brownie points with certain members of the community that this version exists, but <laughs> apart from that. I, I would just like to point out um, a couple of things. The Moto X, getting these wooden backs, that's improving the one part of the design that really didn't need improving and the one part of the phone that they didn't really need improving. So that's a bit of a letdown. You know, it's cool, though, months, Vlad. It's cool. Right, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and, and this is the whole reason, every, you know, people buy Vertifos and other things with luxurious finishes and textures that, you know, don't really serve any practical purpose. I get that. I understand that. Um, I mean, that's why you have sofas that cost, you know, from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand. That's fine. I'm just saying, if you're going to step up or improve the phone in some fashion, that wasn't the bit you wanted to improve on. I would much rather have had one of those epic software updates like the Nexus 5 got for his camera. Like that is still to be like a bit of software magic because the Nexus 5 camera I before mean, Google updated was garbage. If you used if you used the Moto X on day one when it before its camera was updated, uh, you'd realize that it already got that update. <laughs> like the no, camera no. was so bad before, and now it's like sometimes it takes a good picture. Yeah, exactly. That, that's where it's at now, which but, is the same what I'm story saying is, as the Nexus 5. They, they might have been able to keep that going. Like Maybe Google has just set my expectations too high because, again, the Nexus 5 camera was borderline unusable at the beginning. right? You, you need to take like five shots to get one half-decent one, and then they updated it, and they did a lot of really good things, made a lot of good decisions. I would just like to see that happen with the Moto X as well because that phone, all it's really missing is a decent camera and a decent battery. Like th Those are still the two hardest things to nail down, I know, but they're the things that the phone needs. So I uh, I just had a viewer tweet at me saying that if you buy the Moto G from Google and you get the Google Play Edition, you don't get Motorola Assist, you don't get the trusted Bluetooth feature, and you don't get the Motorola Camera app, uh, and they're not available from the Play Store. Oh, so. woe is me, the Motorola Camera app. Well, you know. It's better than the stock Android app if you've ever used that. I mean, the, the trusted Bluetooth feature is pretty cool if you're using a smartwatch. Yeah, it's totally cool. If you've got a Pebble and it just unlocks when your Pebble's automatically connected to it, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, uh, I'd buy it from Motorola. Oh, it's just me. Here's what you do if you want a better camera. You wait for Project Ara, and then you just swap in a better camera module. Boom. There you go. Okay, well... So that means I'll be taking good pictures in about half a decade. That's it. Yeah, that sounds about right. No, well, no, you can just get ZTE's uh, modular phone, which they just showed at CES. It was ZTE, right? I think it was. Yeah, yeah. and you could pair it with ZTE's Pebble knockoff. Yeah. <laughs> or, alternatively, alternatively, and here comes a segue, you can get the Oppo M1 
which has a massive camera which flips around to the front and the back. Right, Dan? Segway. Boom. Segway alert. Yeah, so we reviewed the, or I guess I reviewed the Oppo in one, uh, which is the first phone to ship with CyanogenMod if you want to buy it that way. You can buy it. CyanogenMod's already installed. You don't need to root or hack or uh, sideload or unlock bootloaders or any of that fun stuff. Uh, it just comes with CyanogenMod. Uh, and, you know, CyanogenMod is actually really good. Um, it's a great interpretation of Android. It's really fast. It's really stable. has really great battery life. The Oppo N1, mm, not that great of a device. And but also huge, right? It's massive. It is like... Like, we were talking about the One Max and those other big phones with big batteries before, but, like, the Oppo and the One Max have the same size screen, and the One Max, or the Oppo just feels, like, so much bigger for whatever reason. I think it's probably because of that twisting camera design on top and things like that, but... Uh, oh, dude, the One Max already... It, it feels unreasonably, like, offensively large, so something that feels bigger than it is just wrong. Yeah, I mean, everybody that saw that I showed the Oppo to were just like, they, their, their first reaction was like, oh my god, it's so big, and they laugh. Uh, and it's also really heavy. It's really dense. Well, I, I think a really important point that Oppo and maybe even CyanogenMod are glossing over uh, is that, you know, uh, CyanogenMod is effectively, I mean, it is its own Android skin at this point, and with that distinction comes its own problems, right? So, uh, you know, it, you're not going to... This isn't stock. You're not going to get... They, when Google announces the next version of Android, you're not going to get an update on your N1 the next day. It, it takes time for CyanogenMod right. to pump out a new version. So, that's a good point. So, the actually, the, the final version that, of CyanogenMod that is shipping on the N1 right now is uh, 10.2, which is based off of Android 4.3. So, it's not even on Android 4.4 yet. They, they, yeah. they have, like, beta versions and, and early access builds that you can get that are on Android 4.4, but the final, the final build or the stable build or whatever you want to call it is still on Android 4.3, and it takes quite a few months for them to, to transfer to each version of Android as they come out. Uh, but what I think... The thing that CyanogenMod does, and it's the same thing that Motorola does on the Moto X, is that it takes what is largely a stock experience and just adds a few tweaks underneath and a few enhancements and makes it a better experience, as opposed to the things that HTC and Samsung and LG and everyone else do, where they completely modify the user interface. Uh, and, and, you know, as, a, as someone who usually prefers stock Android, I like that because it's like stock but better. So it's cool. Do you guys remember a few years ago, uh, I remember I wrote about it for Engadget, uh, there was a knockoff Oppo uh, where they switched the P's and O's, where, so it was the poop? <laughs> Every time I see Oppo, I think about that. I Google your, your article on Engadget. The poop it's, phone, yeah. It's the poop flip phone. Yep, <laughs> yep. So if the, if the N1 gets big enough, we might see some more Oppo knockoffs, and I'm hoping that they're branded poop. The poop N1 <laughs> running CyanogenMod Mod would be a pretty... It would be, be the poop number two, though. It would have to be, like, the poop N2. <laughs> the poop N2, yes. <laughs> so that's the Oppo. You can buy it if you want. It's 600 bucks. You don't get LTE. It's really big, and uh, the screen's not that great. So I wouldn't suggest buying it. But it's a bit important move for CyanogenMod. And I think, to be honest with you, I think CyanogenMod's end game here is to just be bought by another company that's larger and can put out good hardware and stuff like that. So we'll see. I mean, that would be good. Uh, particularly if, if it's somebody like Sony, for example, that would be really good. Like, just just envision the engine mod being tucked into Sony with Sony being great on physical design, pushing waterproof phones, pushing, you know, good, attractive, and consistent design, and just lacking that bit of software polish now. You know, the, the big issues were the, the displays, which they actually fixed with the Z1 Compact, and the software, which was always kind of eh, on top of Android. So that's a nice, nice vision, as opposed to freaking Oppo, which you know I think it was the last year CES where they brought their own skin to Android, and it was it was like I think, I think it was Oppo Find Five. Was that was that a phone? Yeah. So so Oppo's Oppo's got its own skin, right, that you can you can buy the N1 with CyanogenMod, or you can buy it with Oppo software if you want, and if you get Oppo software, it's got this what they call color OS, and it's this heavily modified... It's an uh, atrocity. Yeah, it's it's designed for the Chinese market, and it's it's very different than stock Android. I think it's just cruel. 
<laughs> it's an abuse of Android. And speaking of crew, I'm taking my second segue of the day, Dan. I'm totally checking this. You're on, you're on a segue speaking roll. Speaking of crew, there <laughs> is this <laughs> keyboard thing which we reviewed, which turns your iPhone into an elongated, weird BlackBerry clone thing. So, for starters, I think Chris made this point yesterday on Twitter. I mean, they named it the typo. And do they know what typo means? Like, it's the worst <laughs> name ever. I mean, it'd be, it's it's like it's like it reminds me of like the Chevy Nova, which they tried to sell in in Spanish speaking markets, which literally translates to no go. I mean, it's <laughs> like you you don't name a product. I don't need to explain this. I, I just don't need to explain it. It's it's too obvious. Don't don't call this thing the typo. Yeah. But, so but, da- David I, reviewed it. Um, and it's it's, really it's our lowest review score ever, right? Yeah, it's understand. really bad. I, I used it for a few minutes before uh, David took it to do the review, and it's, like, really bad. Like, yeah. like, the thing is, like, iOS doesn't support a keyboard in this fashion. Like, it's a real pain in the butt to be jumping back and forth between you got to keep, like, one finger up here on the touchscreen to move your cursor around, and then you got your thumb down on the, the, the buttons below for typing, and then the keyboard is, like, unreliable, the autocorrect doesn't work. It's just a disaster. I mean, it's it's like Coke coming out with a new soda called Poison. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's literally what this is like. It's not even new Coke. It's just straight poison. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you do not want, buy this product, yeah, Ryan's impressed. If you're watching, I apologize, but we can't recommend your awful iPhone attachment. Yeah, you you probably lost whatever you invested. Um, but hey, any press is a good press, right? Uh, uh, I, would ju- I would just like to announce that while you guys were discussing that keyboard, I managed to get a kink into my cable of my headphones, and just as you guys were finishing, I managed to unwind it, so I feel triumphant right now. <laughs> I, feel, I feel triumphant for two reasons. First of all, we informed the public, we let them know to stay clear of this, and secondly, I figured out how to sort out that kink. So, thumbs up all around. Nicely done. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, even though I screwed up myself. So speaking of hardware keyboards, apparently BlackBerry is going to, uh, I guess, all uh, future devices that the company produces uh, will mostly focus on, on actually having hardware keyboards as they realize that's the only differentiation for their hardware. Uh, and their now CEO, John Chen, who used to be their interim CEO, and they're like, forget it, we're giving up looking for anybody else, and you're now our CEO, uh, said that they're, they're going to be all hardware from here on out. I, you Whether know exactly. Buy one or not, I don't know, because we don't know if they're going to sell consumers or if they're only going to sell the enterprise. It's still like all way up in the air. Well, what's going to happen is in roughly 12 to 18 months, uh, Chen is going to be forced out, and there will be this huge hullabaloo over the fact that like he left with like a 25 million dollar like package, <laughs> golden parachute, and then like they'll find another interim CEO, and this is just going to continue ad nauseum until they're out of money. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't they, know. they have like two billion in the bank, so this is gonna go on for like five years. <laughs> yeah. I, I just feel like this is one of those things where you're making a decision, you're making a stand just to perform the act, you know, just to say, here I am, I'm I'm now in charge, I'm now leading in some direction, so let's take the direction of we're sticking with hardware keyboards. I just I just don't see that. Uh panning out in any sort of positive fashion. I don't care if they're selling it to consumers or to businesses. Ultimately, if anybody's using that hardware keyboard, it's not a computer, it's a person. And the thing is, the thing that people seem to be increasingly recognizing is that the stuff that you like for your personal device is also the stuff you like to use in your business environment as well. You know, people started bringing iPhones, tablets, etc., into their work environment, and those things started off as consumer products. So if a hardware keyboard is still appealing to people, it doesn't matter where you're going to try and sell it. But I don't think it is. Maybe, okay, maybe in um, some markets where they're really very much prevalent, like let's guess Indonesia, uh, those kinds of markets. India. I think it's, it's a rapidly shrinking market base. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and the thing is, you've got guys like Sean Hollister who wrote um, maybe a month or two ago uh, at a you know, a piece for us saying, I come to bury the hardware keyboard. And he, on our staff, was the last person who actually appreciated keyboards, you know? (laughs) Everybody has moved in transition to using touchscreens. Software is transitioning that way. I don't see how you're going to make that work with, um, you know, Android app compatibility if you want to maintain that. uh, Because nobody 
is you know developing apps for hardware keyboards or taking account for hardware keyboards or taking you know capitalizing on their benefit whatever it is anymore it just doesn't make sense we need to move on it's it's like using a queer one ink when you have uh, refillable pens like we just got to get with the times so what you're saying is that in like 3 years all the hipsters in Brooklyn are going to be carrying around qwerty smartphones why because they're going to be retro and yeah it'll be like using a quill and ink pen uh, I guess. I mean, I'm I'm not that savvy with how weird Brooklynites get. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know how how weird. Okay, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. Um, a little deviation here. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, I was listening to his podcast recently, and the man is a genius. He's my idol as far as podcasts go because you you can listen to him for days. But uh, he had a really interesting um, story about uh, that that sort of writing with a quill and ink. The old, the old way, and he was saying that uh, if you do that, when you dip to get some ink, you can only rewrite something like uh, what was it, six or eight words before you need to dip again. And he was saying that that gives you a good rhythm for how people understand and hear things, right? So you should try and make a point every six or eight words, or a sentence six or eight words. Uh, so when he writes his speeches and things, he he tends to do that. He likes to do or write in that rhythm, so it's sort of like I don't know. I don't know how. I don't think it's terribly scientific, but it's like a really odd uh, little benefit to using the old school method, which I would like to point out does not apply to hardware keyboards. <laughs> they have no, you know, discernible benefit anymore. By the way, I'd like to point out that uh, celebrity BlackBerry sightings is still online and going strong. <laughs> you mean celebrities are still using Blackberries? Yeah. Um, There's, like, recent updates? Yeah. That, I mean, the definition of celebrity is starting to morph <laughs> a little bit, I think. But, yes, there are still celebrities using them. I saw a guy in the street. That's celebrity. Boom. So so it's funny because, like, our office in New York City is in Mid Midtown Manhattan, which is, like, there's a lot of, like, businessmen there. And so I've seen quite a few dudes in suits where, using, like, BlackBerry Z10s, like, walking around with them and things like that. And it's, like, the only place that I've ever seen anybody using Z10s, but I've seen more than one. Wait, Z10s, not Q10s? Yeah, Z10s, yeah. Weird. Yeah. I stole Dieter's Z10, and I don't know what happened to it. He's probably going to ask for it at some point. Probably not. not. <laughs> and, and the thing with those businessmen is all I can think is company-issued hardware. Yeah, I mean, that's probably why, because, like, their company has a best server, and they have to access their email, and they drop their other phone or whatever, so. Or they, like, stumbled into the phone shop and accidentally paid for one. It was like, <laughs> Android phone, oh, I slipped, and picked something else up. Maybe I should buy a Z30. <laughs> yes, you should, Chris. <laughs> you can get one unlocked for, like, under 500 bucks. You can also get a lot of things unlocked for under 500 bucks, including a Nexus 5, Moto X. Dude, 25 hours of battery life? I mean, come on. Dude, I'm sure, I'm sure the battery life is actually longer because you're never going to be using the phone anyway, so <laughs> you're lost. Oh, wait, never mind. You can only buy it from Verizon. Never mind. Done. Yeah. How do you think Verizon is offering it in the stores? That's what I'd heard. Like, you could only buy it online. Yeah, that sounds about right. Anyways, that's enough about BlackBerry. Uh, so we've got Mobile World Congress coming up in about a month's time, and so the uh, annual rumor train is uh, kind of starting to gain steam, and there's been, like, a whole lot of crap rumored in the past couple weeks. That's either either whether they're, it's going to supposedly happen at Mobile World Congress or it just is, like, that time of year when there's not much else news going on, so rumors start bubbling up and people are anticipate the next thing. Uh, it seems like we're thick of in the thick of it. And uh, the first one was this uh, new HTC One is supposed to be coming soon in March, uh, according to a report from Bloomberg. Uh, it's going to have a bigger screen and a better camera, which are two things that you, nobody could predict ever uh, <laughs> that a new phone was, would have. Uh, but apparently, the, I think the most interesting thing about this is that the Bloomberg report says it's going to use the HTC One name again. So maybe... HTC is going to do the Apple iPad move and name like three successive years of phones the HTC One or something like that. I mean, it, it makes sense. They, they kind of painted themselves into a corner 
with the name, because I mean, obviously they can't call it the HTC One Two. <laughs> I mean, HTC... Why not? <laughs> and HTC Two sounds weird, so I, mean, I, I could see them doing that. They, they could just, you know, yeah. I mean, Apple. This has been Apple's move for years, right? They just have like, you know, product name and then parentheses the the year that it was released. Right. So. I could see it. Yeah, which Apple tends to get away with because its products are more or less culturally iconic at this point. Um, I think a company like HTC that is kind of stuck in a rut now for many, many months just need, needs to needs to step away from. I mean, it, it needs something novel. It needs to hit people with something so, new. So, I think they ran out of names. Like, like, if you look back at, like, HTC in, like, 2009 to 2012, they released so many phones with so many different names. They're just, like, we're, we're out of names. Right, but it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad right now because you have the desire range, which is supposed to be affordable, emerging markets, et cetera, et cetera. But all you're getting is, like, desire 200, desire 600, blah, blah, blah. And I, I can't keep them straight. I've seen those devices, and they have nice designs, but there's just no d- differentiation. There's no... Dis- a way for me to remember them because they're just tacked on with random numbers after them. It's just, I don't know, it's it, it's hard to excite people. Um, and just repeating the name HT1, this will be the third year with the 1X being the in, initial uh, flagship phone with that name. The two previous ones, even though they've had very good things about them and some not so good, particularly the camera, uh, I haven't sold. You know, they haven't been successful, and the company reiterating the name, and apparently looking at that post uh, written by Addy, reiterating the design just doesn't sound promising to me. Like, you've got to come out with I something mean, new. I mean, to be honest with you, the design and the hardware of HTC's phones, especially in 2013, was not the problem. Like, the... Right. The design of the one is great. The hardware is phenomenal. It's really well put together. It still has like one of the best, if not the best, mobile displays in the market. Uh, it has a fault sure. with the camera, and the battery life was kind of mediocre. But the phone itself, as far as Android phones go, it's like the top of the heap as far as design is concerned. Uh, why people aren't buying HTC phones, I mean, you could come up with a million theories. Uh, coming down to maybe the marketing isn't there. You never see an ad for an HTC One, at least not here in the U.S. Uh, I mean, the other thing is, yeah, the marketing is confused because the company has been pushing quietly brilliant as as its tagline for a long time. For a while, it stopped and then it reiterated it, and at the same time, it's pushing things like boom sound. <laughs> you know, and 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 w- when it had the Beats Audio partnership going, it was kind of trying to be brash and hip and urban like Beats as well and, and it's just it just kind of lost its way like honestly I think Beats Audio is like there you go we, we can just say that <laughs> that's not true but, it, but you know, it is it is it is a fact like I don't know that anybody has something that they had immediately identify with HC phones anymore it used to be together with Samsung just pushing specs really really hard and just having the best specs but then Samsung won that race yeah. Well, I, I think what it, what it has come down to, at least in the U.S., I mean, global markets might be a different story, but in the U.S., uh, the smartphones have just become a big boy's game, and HTC is not a big boy. They, it's Apple, it's Samsung, and frankly, even Sony is starting to muscle its way in, into the market um, because they want to and because they're huge. Uh, HTC doesn't have that muscle, and I don't think that they have the same level I, of bargaining power. I, I think that, that actually, you know, your example of Sony speaks to how difficult it is. Sony is a massive company; it's huge. It's making profits in other parts of the world that it can use to try and push into the U.S. And it's still really, really, really difficult for Sony to get anywhere in the U.S. It's only able to get yeah. its phone on one carrier. It comes six months late later than it comes to other parts of the world. And you know, I, frankly, I, I don't, I, I don't think I've ever seen. An American walking around with a Sony mobile phone, uh, certainly not in, uh, a Sony smartphone. So uh, it, it, that just like speaks to how difficult it is for HTC. HTC managed to get the one eventually on all four carriers here in the U.S. It's available in multiple colors. It struck deals with Best Buy to get exclusive colors and things like that and other promotional things, and it's still not able to turn that into massive sales. So uh, it's it's a really uphill game for it. And plus, they they spent God knows how much money on Robert Downey Jr. last year. Mm-hmm. So. What, whatever happened with that? There was like one ad, right? 
Yeah, but it was... Yeah, I think there was just one ad, but it was pretty long. Like, the full, like, uncut version of the ad, I think, was, like, two minutes. But there was one ad, and there was a million puns on the letters HTC. Yeah. I never saw the ad on TV. It wasn't run during, like, the Grammys or, you know, other big things where people are going to see it. Uh, there was no billboard ads for it that I recall seeing, unless I'm just keep my eyes closed or something. Um, so, so, I don't know. Sh- shall we discuss this twin sensor camera? Now, this is intriguing. It's part of the new One rumor. Yeah, I don't know what to say about it, because it's like, is it another 3D camera? <laughs> that's, what, that's what made me think of, like, there's going to be another camera on there, and then TC is going to buy it just because it's, it's got uh, more than one camera on the back. Uh, but if, if, if it's... Value for your money, man. <laughs> Twin sensor makes me think of a uh, better autofocus system. I don't know. I really have no idea. I like. I, I could just like hypothesize about it. Like the the Canon 7D 70D is a, an SLR camera that's got this dual pixel sensor that is like it uses the sensor to autofocus and it's like really high tech and crazy. But I, I'd be shocked if that came to a phone already. The 70D is a pretty new camera, so. But well, apparently Toshiba have uh, one of these dual sensor chips, um, which do which do appear to have two uh, <coughs> two cameras in the back. Yes, I and, and it has to do with refocusing images. I guess I guess if they're taking you know uh, one photo at a focus that is this is from the camera, then another fo- photo further away, and then giving you a choice between where you want the focus to be. Do you want it near? Do you want it far? And fluctuate between the two maybe with some fancy processing. I don't know. Well, that's no different. I mean, th- that's that's basically the same thing as what Nokia is doing, right? So Nokia yeah. and Sony are doing that trick, kind of. Ah, but, but, but the thing is, they're not taking the photo at the same time. Right. Like, Nokia is doing a series of photos at different distances. But man, I mean, like, putting, you know, I mean, the, the, the camera sensor, especially a good camera sensor, is probably one of the most expensive components in a good smartphone, so doubling that up just so you can get a gimmicky feature like that seems yeah, like a I complete mean, waste. It, it seems like a gimmick. If that is indeed what it does, uh, that seems like a novelty that'll be cool, like, to show off, but what people want in their smartphone cameras, they want it to be fast, they want it to focus reliably, and they want it to work well in really crappy lighting conditions, and they want it to be able to use a fast enough shutter speed so that their kid isn't a blur when they're running around taking a picture. Uh, and, and it doesn't seem like that technology, if that's what it is, uh, would resolve any of that. Oh, we'll see. I don't know. Like I say, Barcelona is a month away. It is a month away. We're going to hear a whole heck of a lot more rumors, I'm sure. It always seems to happen. Uh, for what it's worth, um, Bloomberg says that the one replacement will be released in March, which is actually after Barcelona, or after uh, Mobile World Congress. So, Do you think they'll keep going with the UltraPixel branding? Ultra double pixel. <laughs> <laughs> double ultra pixel. All uh, the way. I think if, if they continue to do the thing uh, with, like, uh, using bigger pixels uh, and lower resolution, like they did with the one, then, then probably. Yeah. I don't know. I would just like to uh, point out, before we wrap up with the HTC and the One stories, that the One X is apparently not going to get an upgrade to Android 4.4, which... Given that we are less than two years away from its big, massive release right around February, um, like I say, two years ago, is disappointing. It is. It's they're pulling a they're pulling a Galaxy Nexus. They're pulling a Galaxy Nexus and they're pulling an HTC One S because they kind of did the same thing with the One S. They 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 marooned that on Android four point one. They're marooning. I, I forgot the- I forgot the One S even existed until you just said <laughs> See, it. So, so that's kind of like the problem, right? So, like they were mar- they were marooning that on Android 4.1. They were marooning, marooning one the One X and the One X Plus on Android 4.2 or 4.3. But the the thing is, like, if you look at their sales numbers, like HTC sold no One Xs. Like, how many do they have out there to support? And at at some point, you got to be like, yeah, I kind of understand that the company is like, we've got to just like cut our losses and move forward, uh, and put our efforts towards something new. You know why they're I, – I, I guarantee you the reason they're actually doing this is because for reasons only clear to HTC, they made uh, 1Xs with both Qualcomm and NVIDIA processors. And they're like – Well, I mean, it's it, the, the first – so the first one the first one X that came out in internationally had the Tegra 3 trip, chip, 
uh, the, the NVIDIA chip, and it did not have LTE because t there was no LTE available for the Tegra 3. And then uh, when they released in the U.S., they released it with a Qualcomm processor because it supported LTE. At first, but then they released a version on AT&T with the Tegra 3. Because it, it got LTE. <laughs> right, so, right. So uh, I'm just saying, like, they're, they're staring down the barrel of, like, this fragmented, uh, oh, crap, we need to deliver uh, every Android update for this phone on at least two different chips. Right. And instead, they're just like, well, screw it. We're just going to move on. We're going to cut our losses and move on. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not good. And it's not good. And I, I would just like to say it. It's certainly I not have, good for consumer confidence, that's for sure. I have, exactly. I haven't forgotten about the One S, unlike you guys. I review that phone, and I still love it dearly. Like, again, industrial design, screen quality. Eh, screen quality wasn't... No. Yeah, the screen quality was bad on that one. It's a QHD display. Right, right. But... I mean, the industrial design was really nice. Yeah. It, it was one of those phones where we saw leaked pictures of it, and I was really brazen about it. I was saying, oh, it just looks like another HTC. But when you felt it in your hand, it was really well designed, really well put together. So, I mean, this story needs to, like, just end, where you say HTC has great industrial design, may cameras, iffy software, and unreliable software updates. Like, the latter parts of this need to change if HTC wants to sort itself out. And then it needs to get people to buy them. Yes. But that's people will. That, that's the whole point. If you if you deliver on these things, people will buy your phones. But right now... No, I, no they won't. That, that's the, that's, that is why the smartphone industry is so fundamentally broken. That might be true in Europe, Vlad, but in the U.S., the quality of the phone has very little to yes. do with whether consumers will buy it. Because the, the power ultimately is in the hands of the carriers, which phones they're pushing, which phones they're marketing, and, of course, that has nothing to do with which phones are best, right? I mean, for God's sake, we have two carriers now that have announced they're going to carry the G Flex. So, like, three, that, three carriers. Three, three carriers, excuse me. So that should tell you everything you need to know about how much they care about, like, putting the right phone in consumers' hands. <laughs> but, okay, right, fine, fair enough. But would you not accept the countervailing theory that a LG is only able to push the G Flex on people because of the success of the G2? And of its uh, participation in the Nexus program. Uh, maybe, no, I think the maybe G they have has confidence. Now. I think the G Flex has its own novelty of being a, a stupid phone with a curve, and that's easy to put on a poster, and like market. That that much is true. That much is true. Also, but we don't. Uh, I mean, like, we also don't know how many people are actually going to buy the thing. So, I, I don't think there'll be many. I don't think there'll be many. No. As novel and as weird as it looks, it's also uh, expensive. Yeah. AT and T is going to sell for three hundred bucks on contract. Yeah, ouch. So, yeah, it's pricey. Yeah. Um, um, well, let, let's just mention that it's coming to Europe uh, in February as well. So it's it's what? actually getting so much wider distribution. It's only been available in Asia so far. The whole uh, world is getting blessed with the G Flex. Yeah, and, and initially we thought it'd just be kind of a quirky one-off thing just for Korea. So it's, well, it's that's getting... Kind of what, well, that's kind of what's happened with the so far with the Galaxy Round, right? Like, it's that hasn't really left Korea. Yeah, and funny enough, when I played with both of them at CES, I completely changed my mind. Oh, I, I meant to play with a round, and I totally forgot. I, I, I thought the G Flex was really fun as an idea, and looking at it in pictures and video, but when you put it in your hand, it's just weird, and it doesn't feel great at all. But the Galaxy Round, on the other hand, is just kind of nice. Like, <laughs> it, that's, that's all I can really say about it. It's, it's nothing that will pay extra money for, relative to the Galaxy Note 3, which this basically is, but it's just nice. Did you try uh, Did you try putting it against your head? Yes, and in my pocket. And, I had and both, it was okay? I had both of them in my pockets, the round and the flex, and it was better with the round. Like, the whole idea of the G-Flex being curved to the shape of your face is nonsense. It's a six-inch phone. It's a slab. <laughs> I mean, you have a slab next to your head. You might as well, like, put a book right there. It's crazy. A bendy book. Did you did you do the little thing where you put it on the table and you tilt it? Of to... course, because that was the first thing I did. Like <laughs> flip it over and just flex it. No, I mean on the on the round. The round, like you put it on the table and then you tilt one side and it's supposed to like wake up and show you your notifications or some other nonsense. I believe Samsung has a trademark term for that. It's called round interaction, right? <laughs> I'm not making this up. It's called Samsung round interaction. I gotta look this up. Really? To make sure I'm not making this up. It's not S branded. What sort of an emission is that? Uh, S round. Wait, wait. S round. Yes, Samsung round interaction. <laughs> I knew it. 
Be proud of yourself for knowing that one, Chris. Yep. Uh, speaking of Samsung, so uh, we've seen some leaks and some rumors uh, that the Galaxy S5 might have this like crazy new home screen that looks kind of like Google Now, but almost better, which is like really hard for me to say about a Samsung software product. Uh, with all these contextual cards and things like that that's supposed to show you your upcoming mm-hmm. appointments and... The only question I have is whether when you turn it on out of the box, is it going to say a life companion? That's the it, only thing that matters. It, if it doesn't, is it really a Samsung? Right. <laughs> uh, my my ahead, issue bud. with this is, yeah, it looks promising, but remember it's Samsung doing it. Okay, it's a, it's, it's a, it, to me it boils down to something as simple as that. I have confidence with Google when they're doing things like Google Now, and again, the thing that I uh, commended earlier, the voice recognition, uh, that is not easy to do or to achieve, Partic- particularly somebody like me who has the weirdest uh, amalgamation of Bulgarian, American, and English accents. You know, to get clear and consistent voice recognition is hard, and Google are doing it. So aside from their decisions, which are a bit iffy, Google do good software. But Samsung? When have we said that about them? Like, you, you can make really pretty looking cards, but the information that underpins them, like all of my flight info, it, it's going to want me to probably open up a Samsung account and feed it all that data. It's yeah, not, that's it's a not big question. Using, like Google Now data and stuff like that. Right, where's it going to get? Like, obviously, Google gets all that data from your searches and it scans your email inbox and things like that, but where would Samsung get, get all that data? So, right, and, and I mean, look at things like uh, the Games Hub or the Music Hub or the Samsung App Store and all of those things. I mean, let's be honest, they're just garbage. You, you can lose them from your phone one day and you'll be like, you, you won't know it. Like so, Somebody might tell you in, in a few weeks after that or a few months after that, hey, your Samsung App Store is not available on your phone anymore. And you'll be like, oh, okay. <laughs> my, my life has not changed. And that's the, that's the really quite frustrating thing with new Samsung phones. Um, with a ga- and, and it's going to happen with a Galaxy S5. We're going to be hit with a freaking deluge of specs and features and added content and whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and you and I, we're going to spend our days, you know, we're going to spend a week trying to detail all of these S features. Trying well, to speaking of S features, explain apparently things. Samsung is going to bring things back to basics and add an iris scanner. Yeah, bringing, back to, bringing things back to basics means not adding things. It's taking things away. Uh, and an so. air scanner is just like bonkers to me. But just to finish the point, I was saying, we're going to spend a week detailing all these features, and then a couple of months after that, nobody's going to be using them. That's the frustrating thing. To me. Like, the phones themselves are going to have great specs. They're going to be really good in some aspects and iffy in others. But it just frustrates me that Samsung just throws all this garbage at you. Why do you need an iris scan? I mean, give me an answer to that. I mean, like, I don't know, but Samsung sells these by the boatload, so... I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if people care about the Samsung features or if they, they care about an iris scanner or whatever, but people are going to buy whatever the new Samsung phone is when it comes out, and they're going to buy it by the truckload. If the iris scanner actually works well, I will actually celebrate that feature. I mean, you know, I use Touch ID on the on the 5S. So it works okay. It sucks. Um, it's terrible. But I'm always I'm always looking for a better and faster and more secure way to get into the phone. Um, and you know, the iris scanner might be that. We'll see. That's what I like. Like that's why I like the trusted Bluetooth feature on the Moto X. If you've got any Bluetooth device on your person. If you're one of the people that use a Bluetooth headset, or if you've got Bluetooth headphones, or you got a, a smartwatch, you know, it, it, your phone is unlocked, and then if you get separated from your phone, it locks. Yeah, but that doesn't prevent the, the situation where you're at a, a bar, and your, your phone is out, and one of your jerk friends takes your phone <laughs> out of your hand, and then starts going through your text messages. It doesn't help with that. <laughs> Just going to point that out. you got to get new friends, Chris. Because yeah, but... the, the Bluetooth range is, you know is too small. So it's, it, the, the phone still thinks that you're, you know, you're connected to the to it. But, uh, Chris, let, let's be honest. That's kind of a limited usage scenario. I think all of these biometric identification methods, they just kind of add a layer of awkwardness. 
Like, if you think about uh, the ultra-sensitive touch that people put, Nokia, Samsung, etc., everybody's putting it now, to let you use a phone with gloves on, that's a great way uh, or a great example of adding technology to a phone where it immediately materially improves your life, makes it more convenient. Right. But on the flip side, if you have an iris scanner and you live in somewhere like Dubai where it's sunny 99% of the time, how are you going to wear your sunglasses and unlock your phone? I, don't, I, I think your point is mute, moot because uh, in Dubai you only buy Porsche design Blackberries. Ah, that's a good point. That is a very good point. I actually saw one of those in like when we were when I was in Las Vegas for CES. I was walking through one of the casinos and there's a Porsche design store, so I ducked in to see the Panana or whatever it is, the, the 9982 <laughs> uh, under its little case, and they had a gold one there. Did you buy Dude, it? It was like twenty five thousand dollars. Oh my god. <laughs> Dude, I'm sorry, but I really want us to make this Panan on our phone happen. <laughs> like, it's we, happened we, twice. There's two of them. <laughs> no, but no, but literally a Panan on our phone. Like, we need to pull our birds with and be like, how do you guys feel about making a phone called Panan on our? No, there would have to be a BlackBerry. It would have to be a BlackBerry Panan on our. <laughs> but, okay, you know what? Throw that to go into to everybody. Sony, uh, HTC, LG, make us a put on our phone. I, I'm down. I'm down. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll give it our first 10 rating. I, okay, here's what you do, Vlad. You call Samsung and you say, hey, uh, this is U.S. cellular. Uh, <laughs> we we want to we wanna put uh, a phone uh, on, on our network next week. We want it to be called the Galaxy Panana. Uh, and we'd like it to be a down-market Galaxy S4. Samsung would be like, no problem. <laughs> Next day, you'd have 10,000 Galaxy Panananas on your doorstep. They're like, no problem. We're going to put 1,000 engineers on this. Yep. <laughs> it'll we'll have it in a day. <laughs> Branded and everything. Galaxy, Galaxy Panana, US cellular silk screen across the bottom. Uh, We're going to launch a works. really awkward commercial for you. <laughs> <laughs> starring, uh, starring Lionel Messi. Yeah, uh, sadly, uh, that is not that far out of the realm of <laughs> possible. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm losing my voice, so we've got one last rumor to talk about. So this 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 Nokia Android phone, uh, like, won't go away. Uh, it's popped up in a prototype form now, so it's actually like not a render but a physical thing. It exists uh, somewhere in the world. Yeah, you know what it feels like to me? It feels like to me that there's this team at Nokia that was assigned to work on an Android phone, and then Microsoft came storming in, and they're just, like, super bitter, so they are leaking things out left and right. This is like, you know, there's that story a couple days ago about how um, that Japanese soldier during World War II, like, he held out in the jungle for, for like, 25 years after World War II ended, and he, he just died recently, but, like, that, that was his claim to fame, is that, like, he, he kept fighting for the Japanese long after the war was over. This is exactly what's happening with Nokia. There's this team, and they're like, well, we don't care that Microsoft is buying us, we're, we're committed, we're heads down, we're staying on this. All, but all kidding aside, so here's what I think, Tom and I have been talking a lot about this. I, I think what's going to happen... I don't know if Tom necessarily agrees with me. Tom is about to to uh, chat me right now when I when I say this. But I, I, th I think what's going to happen is uh, the Microsoft deal. Uh, my my feeling is that this phone was originally intended to be announced at MWC, uh, but the Microsoft deal will close before MWC, and Microsoft's very first move as Nokia's new or new owner is to kill this project. That there's no way Microsoft is going to permit an Android device to be sold so, with the Microsoft name on it. The thing is, like, it's it's a forked version of Android, so it's not even like Android Android because it's not going to have the Google Play Store, it's not going to have Google services. So Microsoft like actually makes apps for Android phones, and it could just load these up with its Outlook app and its Bing app and its Bing Maps and all that other crap. Uh, and, and still get all the data that they would collect from those apps. So, I, I mean, I see your point that, like, there's this pride thing of not wanting to release an Android phone, but it, it, it's also, like, in the same way that it doesn't feel, when I'm using a Kindle Fire, it doesn't feel like I'm using an Android device. It feels like I'm using a Kindle device. I think that's uh, because it's, it's, like, so separated from what Android actually is recognized as. I, I would just 
I would just say um, my perspective on this was exactly the one that Chris expressed. The fact that whatever Nokia flirtations might have been with Android would have just been put to a dead end as soon as Microsoft you know, decided to take over the company. But there's just been so much talk and so much information coming out about this. And like Dan says, it's in prototype form, it's floating around. Um, and, and also, let's not forget, this isn't supposed to be a flagship or in any way something that competes with uh, the Windows phones of the company. Th this was essentially supposed to be the thing that goes in between the Asher range of low-end uh, Series 40, or whatever the software is called now, uh, devices, and Windows phones. It's kind of supposed to be bri bridging the gap. Or even, um, even replacing those Asher phones eventually. Yeah. Right. So it's it's like... Yes, the obvious uh, conclusion is this will never see the light of day other than these leaks, but then so much conversation is going on and people are taking it kind of seriously, so it's, it's like odd to me. I, I don't know how to feel about it. And also, to Dan's point though, if you don't have the Google Play services, if you don't have Gmail, if you don't have Google Maps, if what you get on there is like, some Android version of Outlook and Bing Which Maps exists. and Bing Search. There's Android apps for Outlook. There's Android Bing apps. There's Android Bing Maps, I think. Uh, Verizon actually tried to sell an Android phone that took out all the Google stuff and replaced it with Bing stuff, and it was a horrible, horrible thing. But Samsung was Continuum. No, it, exactly. well, the Continuum was one of them, but it wasn't the first one. Uh, that's Neelan exactly what I was going to say. That's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, as much as everybody else might hate it, a big part of Android's appeal now is still the Google Play services. Like, you want those apps on your phone. It's, it's, it's that simple. And well, I think replacing it, them with Microsoft phones is... Sure, but in, in, in emerging markets, I mean, you don't get those on an Asha phone now, and you don't have that option unless unless it's like a low-end Huawei or ZTE phone that is being sold. Okay, okay that's fair. That's, that's a fair point. Uh, I take it. But, I mean... Ultimately, we are still talking to more of an audience in the developed market, and and the fact of the matter is, like as far as I'm concerned, the strength of Android's appeal is still in things like Gmail and Chrome and being able to sync it and Google Maps and all of those reliable things. And replacing them with Microsoft alternatives just doesn't fill me with any sort of confidence. So yes, we all had that beautiful dream of a Nokia Android phone, uh, which kind of looks like the N9, but you know run some quality apps and some software via the future. I don't think that's going to happen, even well, if this phone is released. So there are two scenarios uh, that I see happening here, and either one, I, I'm really excited about it. Uh, one is this phone is released with some garbage custom Android build on it, and it's immediately torn apart by the Cyanogen Mod team, and we get a sweet build of Cyanogen Mod for it. Two... The phone is never released, and then uh, the prototypes become collector's items, and I hustle literally everyone <laughs> I know to try and dredge up one for my collection. Uh, either scenario I'm totally okay with. Okay. And, uh, so so that that's Chris Ziegler covered, but the rest of us <laughs> keep waiting. <laughs> that's right. On that note, I think that uh, wraps up the Verge Mobile Show for this week. The week of January 20th, 2014. Uh, this has been episode 76. Uh, thanks for tuning in if you're watching this live or listening to it live, and, or thanks for listening if you happen to catch the recording. Uh, I'm Dan Seifert. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm DC Seifert. Vlad is Vlad Savov. Chris is Z Power. Dieter, who will hopefully be back with us next week, assuming his plane ever makes it from Minnesota to New York, uh, is Backlon. Uh, we're all at Verge. You can, of course, leave comments on the post and things like that and uh, or tweet at us, and we'd love to hear from you. So until next time, thanks, everyone. All right.